Welcome to an all-new episode of Get Lit with Leanna, the podcast. Join me as I sit down with a new guest author in each episode to discuss their books, careers, and everything in between. Today I'm joined by debut romance author Regina Black to talk about her new book, The Art of Scandal. I absolutely loved getting to chat with Regina today about the genesis of her career, how the story came to her, and then some of the most pivotal moments of this book. She was such a delight to get to know and so insightful. I really think you're all going to love this episode. This is one of my favorite books of the year. It's such an interesting love story, and it really plays on a few different tropes. So without further ado, my conversation with Regina Black starts right now. Welcome, Regina, to the podcast. I'm very excited to have you here. Obviously, I just read your debut, The Art of Scandal, like a week ago, and I cannot stop thinking about it. It's, I mean, I've posted this kind of already on my Instagram, but like, this is really one of my favorite books that I've read yet this year. And I'm so excited and honored and touched that you want to come on the show. You want to talk about it. So first of all, welcome. Thank you. And firstly, I kind of would just love to get to like know you and your background a bit more, because obviously being a first time writer, this is like our literally our introduction to you. So if you don't mind like bringing me back a bit, obviously you have a very different background. I would love to hear more of like kind of how this entire thing happened, how like take me back to the beginning. <laughs> well, I'm going to go back to third grade. I'm Please do. Gonna- that's when I started writing. I've been writing most of my life. So a lot of people are like, when did you start writing? When did you get into reading? I can't remember a time I wasn't doing both of those things. Like, um, so I've been writing pretty much my whole life. I started with like short fiction, like there were some poems in there. Um, I did it all the way through high school and college. Um, and then in college slash the beginning of law school, I kind of dealt with a lot of that school pressure. I kind of got into fandom a little bit, like dip my toe in fandom. (laughs) Um, And uh, it was really great for practicing writing and developing my voice. I credit that a lot with figuring out kind of what my writing sounded like and trying to figure out, okay, what's a character voice sounds like? Because you're trying to you know, capture the voice of your favorite characters. And so it was a great writing exercise. Um, And then around that time, I also started a fiction archive with some friends of mine that was focused on women of color. So it was just a website for people that wanted to write um, original fiction, fan fiction, whatever. It just had to kind of center around the experiences of women of color. And through that archive, I think I wrote like, um, 10 or 11 full length novels, novellas. It was, you know, it was a, I would post updates and things. Um, and it was great. It was, that was my training ground. And it just never even occurred to me to query an agent or try to get an agent or a publishing deal. Like, I just never thought of my, I just never thought of my writing was really good enough. So fast forward, got married, start a family stop writing for a long time. (laughs) And, but in the back of my mind, I was always like, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to come back to this. And about 2019, I went back to some of my old files and found some unfinished ideas and started playing around with them. And one of those ideas ended up being the art of scandal. So this and original idea is pretty old. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I need to like talk about the conception of the story and the idea, but before we get to that, I would love to know like what kind of drove you to take that leap and be like, okay, I think I want to take this story and I want to query an agent and I want to see if I can get this published. Like what was the drive behind that? So it was a combination of things. It was a little bit of you know, my daughter, I had gotten married, I had my daughter. And then, you know, there are certain birthday milestones where you kind of stop and go, hey, are you ever going to do this thing? And it was a little bit of that. Um, And I also, I was working on two different books. And the other one was like a rom-com. It was actually a (laughs) rom-com. Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> and that was actually the book that I thought I was like, I'm going to do something with this book. Maybe I'll self-publish it. Maybe I'll try to get it published. I don't know. But I was struggling with it and I didn't really know why. And I just blamed it on it's been a long time since I wrote anything. And so I went and got the scandal idea and said, oh, this one's really fun. Let me reteach myself how to write with this book. And so I just sat down and kind of flew through the first draft because I was, you know, I was like, no, I'm just having a good time. I'm relearning how to write. And I got to the end of it and I was like, I really like this. But it had been so long since I gotten feedback or anything. Um, I started looking online for ways to kind of meet writers and things like that. And I came across a program called Pitch Wars. Um, and that program that they no longer run that program, but it had been run for 10 years. And it's a pretty, pretty well-known program in publishing that a lot of big authors came out of. And one of the things I read about it is, hey, even if you don't get picked for this program, you usually get some feedback from published authors. You know, if they read your full manuscript and I was like, that sounds amazing. That's exactly what I'm looking for. And so I think about over 4,000 people applied to that program (laughs) the year that I applied uh, for like 100 mentors. So um, I had no expectations (laughs) of getting picked. So I submitted it and uh, Denise Williams and Cherish Reed selected my manuscript. Like they requested my manuscript and I was like, great, I won. They're going to give me feedback. (laughs) And they ended up choosing my book. Oh my gosh. To mentor my book. And I was just blown away. So keep in mind, no expectation of querying at this point, no expectation. Oh, this is going to be my debut. It was just me figuring out if I could write again. So they pick my book and I worked with them for a few months. And at the end of Pitch Wars, there's an agent showcase uh, where people see the pitch for your book. And, and, you know, at that time I was looking at the romance market going, this book doesn't really fit. (laughs) Like my expectations were super low because it wasn't a rom-com and that was really popular. And so I was just blown away by the response in the showcase. I got a ton, like, 30 agents wanted to see it. I got eight offers of representation for it. Like I wasn't prepared for any of this. I'm still not, I don't think. (laughs) So So if you don't mind me asking though, sorry to interject, but like what point was this story when you submitted it? Like is the version that you submitted to Pitch Wars the version that we're reading now? Or was there a lot of tweaks along the way? Absolutely not. Okay. (laughs) The version that I submitted to Pitch Wars, this was very much... You know, when I sat down to write this book, I said, I'm going to write a romance. I love romance. I've been reading it my whole life. Um, It very much was like a straightforward romance. And it was interesting working with my mentors. It was it was still that. But we, you know, we changed some things. Um, But one of the big things that happened during the process of between pitch wars and selling the book was. I learned a little bit more about what I was actually writing. That sounds weird, um, but where my strengths were in the book. Um, So there were parts of the book that kind of delved into some of the more deeper like themes and some of the background of the characters and things. And those were things that I put in the book because that's just what I write about. Um, But as I went through different revisions, those were the things that like my agent and my editor said, this stuff is good. We need more of this, like dive deeper into her, dive deeper into him. And it just kind of evolved into this really more character focused, but also plot forward romance. I just I'm in love with what the book is now. So it was it was a really great process. It's so it's so funny that you like say that you wanted to like dive deeper and lean into those like parts of the story more. Mm-hmm. I my favorite book of all time is The Idea of You by Robin Lee. I don't know if you've read it. You're nodding, so you've you've read it or you're familiar. Mm-hmm. And it's my favorite 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 love story that I've ever read. And for the last like four years, I've been desperately trying to find books that like remind me of it. And I've found a few that have come pretty close. Like I find a few of Kennedy Ryan's books come close. I find Tia Williams very similar, but I have to say like this book in particular gave me all of the same like aching uh, feeling while reading it. 
Yes. And it's like such a compliment coming. Like, I think, I hope that you take it as a compliment. Like I, like I, I really like was mesmerized by the story and I read it in one sitting. I literally sat, I was like for five hours and I did not get up and I was just like immersed in the story. And it's just such a simple plot line. Like, it's not like it's anything so like out of this world, can't believe unrealistic. Like it's such a, 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 a familiar storyline but it's executed in such a unique way when you first came back to the story because you said you had written it and then you took a break and you would come back to it like what about this story were you like I think this is the one I need to go forward and put forward with like even in that time jump like that that story still kind of stood the test of time if you will like tell me about that decision in picking the story and maybe how the concept came to you or how you evolved it like I would love to know more about the actual concept So the concept, like originally, I just knew it was around like 2010 or something like that. So originally, I just knew I wanted to write a story about a woman who on the outside, her life was perfect and kind of falling apart behind the scenes. Um, I knew that she was going to experience some sort of betrayal. That betrayal kind of changed a few times, like, you know, it was a financial betrayal or something like that. I I just knew it was a big lie. Uh, And then I came back to infidelity because that's kind of like, I don't know, that's one of those emotional betrayers. It's, It's a universal feeling of everyone kind of even if that hasn't happened to you, it's very easy to latch on to. Like, we all know how much that would hurt. Um, and then I think I didn't get to the actual logistics of he's a politician and this is a scandal until I kind of came back to the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that's more of a reflection of the fact that I was older, I got married and had a family. So a lot of like the scandal part, the political part, Like I could look back on a lot of the kind of more famous sex scandals and things like that and have a little more insight into them. Um, She definitely evolved. That's when her being a mother came into it. I definitely think that that period of kind of, you know, being married allowed me to write like a married woman in a more realistic way, some things like that. So Um, it definitely intrigued me to write Rachel as a character. So that's really kind of what brought me back to it. And also because I was looking for something that was going to kind of teach me how to write again, this story really is structured. I think that familiar feeling you have, it's very much structured like a daytime drama or a primetime drama. And that's extremely intentional. And uh, I grew up watching those. So my background is kind of like a combination of soap super couples plus romance books. Like I that, that yeah. is me in a nutshell. And the things I like the most about those are it's kind of a universal format that's like buried in a lot of the modern things we like, we watch and love today, like Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, you know, Bridget, what everything Shonda Rhimes is doing is very much of that ilk where you have this core romance with this high conflict. And then you have this big world and that propulsive feeling you get where you're like, I just want to see what's going to happen next. I just want to exactly. see what's going to happen next. That is all very intentional. And that's one of the reasons why I think this one in particular appealed to me because it was just a combination of everything I absolutely love. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I think the story evolved and why I went back to this particular story instead of the rom-com, which would, wasn't really doing that for me at the time. Fair enough. And it's funny that you mentioned like Shonda's like TV shows. I'm like the biggest Shonda fan. Like I think I'm one of the only people that like has consistently not given up on Grey's Anatomy since like 2004. Like I literally started watching when I was like nine. Now I'm like 29 and still watching. So I fully, fully like resonated with that. And I felt also like when I was reading the book and I binged it, as I said, like I felt like I was watching it unfold. Do you, are you somebody that like when you read books, are you somebody that also like visualizes yes. what you're seeing, like watching in a movie? Yeah. Cause I've, I've had such a mixed bag of authors and like other creators and just like friends that I've chatted mm-hmm. with who like love reading books. Some people don't see anything when they read. And to me, that's the most insane thing. So I know we're getting off track, but I just needed to know if you're like me or if you're one of the weirdos. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> no, definitely. I I see it in my head like a movie. My editor said you have a very cin- cinematic way of writing. And I was like, yeah, that tracks. That's yeah. me. <laughs> okay, so before we go any further, I feel like we've talked a lot about this book, but for those who have not yet read the book, can you give yeah. a little like summary of what to expect when picking it up? Yeah, so uh, we've been talking a lot about Shonda Rhimes. So when I originally pitched the book, I said it's Shonda Rhimes reboots The Good Wife. Like that was my original pitch. Love that. Uh, and it's a contemporary romance that's a little steamy about a woman who agrees to fake a uh, perfect marriage for her cheating husband's political campaign in exchange for a million dollar divorce, divorce settlement. But then she starts questioning all her choices when she starts falling for this young artist, 26 year old artist who also has some secrets that he of his own that he's hiding. Yeah. Um, Rachel, as the main character, was so compelling. And at first, I don't know if this was intentional or if this is the way I was reading it, but at first I find it almost like hard to like her, mm. like challenging to get on her side. And even though like, you know, you should be on her side because she just found out that her husband's cheating on her and now she's being sucked into this, like needing to stay with him for appearance purposes. There was something about her that I found to be like a bit rough around the edges. And as I continued to read it, I fell more and more in love with her. And normally I fall in love with the hero, like the male character, the love interest in regardless of like the relationship. But I found that when I was reading this book, I was falling more in love with her. And I need to know if you had that feedback, if that was intentional, if it's just the way I was reading it. If like, I, I would love to know like y- your creation of Rachel as a character and like what you your intention, I guess, was with her. So Rachel was an interesting character for me because I always struggle a little bit at first with my women characters um, because I think I'm just too close to them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you can see a character, you love your character, you kind of want to protect your character. Well, you know, that's not compelling. And I have <clears throat> the best critique partner. Uh, my twin sister is my critique partner. Um, and I she's the that. absolute best. She will tell me, she's like, I see what you're trying to do here. You're not doing it. Or she will be like, you know, this character you need to push yourself more. And she absolutely did this with Rachel as a character. So the first version of Rachel was very kind of, I don't want to say passive, but she definitely was kind of being pulled along by this villainous husband who was just kind of a little more mustache twirly. Like, <laughs> and my, you know, she was like, this just not as compelling, you know? And so I really thought about, what I was protecting Rachel from. And it was really this perception of, you know, with women in general, the idea that we would marry someone for money or that we want money, you know, that's something that she would get judged for. And that's kind of embedded in the book. When you read the book, there is a little bit of that. She agreed to certain things because she didn't want to be perceived as money grubbing or a gold digger, that sort of thing. And that's a commentary on that. And so I really looked at Rachel and I said, okay, what am I have her having her do? And what choices am I having her make? Because I'm kind of internalizing that, mm. oh, she shouldn't want these things. She shouldn't be this way. She should be kind. And so in revisions, one of the big things I changed is I made Rachel be the one that say, okay, but you're going to give me this money and you're going to give me the house if you want me to stay. So, and that just kind of unlocked her character for me. Um, Rachel is very much a survivor. She's very much someone who has experienced all these things in her past. And when this happens, it all just comes back to the surface and she is just fighting from day one. She's like, you're not going to put me back there. I'm not going back there. My daughter is not going back there because she doesn't feel like she fought in the past hard enough. And that's why she ended up in such a bad situation. So I, I really don't. But I don't really write characters that don't have flaws. And so once I did that with her, she just became, to me, she became like a person to me. She kind of came alive as a character for me. So she's very, very dynamic. And I just, as the story went on and the more you read and the more you like learned about her past and the more that you got into her new relationship, like I just found she even be exactly what you just said, like she became more human and less like, fictional 
yes. perfect cookie cutter, you know? Yeah. And I mean, and it was fun to play with that because that is the impression that people have of her. That is her persona. And um, she grapples with this kind of cold image that the public has of her. And it's just a protect, it's the way she's always just protected herself. Um, so, and to see that kind of unravel as the book goes on is part of her journey. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is a romance. There's a whole love story element to it, but it's a very interesting way to kick off a romance. And the meet cute, if you will, of the book is a very interesting circumstance. Mm -hmm. Why did you kind of want to kick off a love story at such a turning point in Rachel's life? Like you're, you, she's just found out that her husband's been cheating on her and basically immediately she falls into some a new relationship. Like, tell me about that decision and kind of starting a love story at that point. So I knew the type of plot that I was thinking of. Um, if you have like someone who's in their normal everyday life making rational decisions, she absolutely would not go to the, she would not do what she did. She would not, um, probably she would have met this man and said, oh, he's attractive and gone on with her life, like that sort of thing. I knew I wanted to have both of them kind of at this point in their lives where they were extremely emotionally vulnerable or they were starting to question a lot of things. And it just kind of made them both kind of poised for mm-hmm. that intense connection. So one of the things I always ask myself when I write a romance is why this person, why now? Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, I just don't want to write romances where it's like I'm bopping along and he's just so Mm -hmm. attractive. I can't help myself. Like that. How often does that happen? And so when I sat down and said, okay, why now, why would this person, it, it really made me think of what kind of situation would she be in and what kind of emotional state would she be in to where she just would kind of rip open this shield that she always carries around and just be really frank and really honest with someone she doesn't really know. And it, and that's why I placed it so close together that she was just at that point in the book, she's just like, I don't care about any of this. Yeah. So, and that's how she ends up inadvertently bonding with this man that she has no idea is going to end up being like the love of her life. Mm-hmm. So. Speaking about him being the love of her life, I would love to talk about the tropes and Mm -hmm. like the themes of this book because you play so well with so many like underused tropes, I find. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about the whole age gap, first of all, I hate when people call it a reverse age gap because like an age gap is an age gap. And like, why do we have to like genderize who's older than who? But regardless, (laughs) I I, like really love that it was never specified like, oh, she's 39 and he's 24. Like it was never actually like said on page so first tell me about that decision but also then just tell me in general about like the tropes you use the tropes you played with like why you were excited to use them for this story like I just love tropes so I love asking these types of questions yeah so I feel like my trope use is like is instinctual because when I've just read so many romances over the years and I just know that structure so well that it just when I sit down and develop a romance, they're going to slowly come out. And that that's another reason I like to subvert them and tweak them and play with them uh, a little bit. Um, with age gap, one of the things um, age gap is one of those tropes that I'm always 50 50 on. And one of my favorite things to do is take a trope that I kind of go, do I like this trope? And think through, okay, what is it about that trope that maybe maybe doesn't work for me in some instances and kind of play around with it until it does. That's a nice, fun challenge for me. Mm-hmm. And so here, when I decided I'm going to do an age gap, I started thinking through things like power dynamics and what really would be the things that brought them together and what would be the things that would impact the relationship because there's such there's a decade between them like what what would be those things and so I had to really think about like what does Nathan represent to her so in their arcs I liked playing with the idea that Rachel is kind of going back to this youthful passion that she gave up and Nathan represents that for her in a way um, and it just really aligns with our arc. <clears throat> and for Nathan, it's the same thing. 
he's in this coming of age kind of inflection point where he's realizing, wait, I do have more, I have control over the trajectory of my life. And my parents are actual human beings. They're not just mother and father. And he falls for an older woman because he is kind of transitioning into that. And so that was fun to kind of tie their arcs to the nature of the trope. So that was a fun thing. Um, Marriage of convenience is one of my favorite tropes in here. I call this like a marriage of inconvenience. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Um, So it was kind of fun to play with the a combination of the fake marriage, fake dating trope in a way that's not, you know, between the main couple, but it's just something that this thing, this thing she's having to deal with and it's part of the conflict. So that was fun. Um, and I, I know that there are other like small little micro tropes buried in there. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was fun to kind of really look at those tropes and think, what are some cool ways that I can play with these in this book? So now that the book, I mean, by the time this podcast is out, the book will be out there. So now that everyone could go and grab it, like what is the number one thing you're hoping people take away from the story or something you hope that like sparks a conversation? Like what's kind of the main goal here with the publication of this book? Well, you know, more than anything, I want people to have a good time when they read this book. I mean, that's that's honestly, I had a good time writing it. I want it to be the book that you binge and the book that you talk to your friends about. And you're like, man, I just had a really great <laughs> emotional experience reading that book. That is absolutely the type of book that I set out to write. And I hope people have that experience. Um, also, I really want people to talk about Rachel and her decisions and some of the issues that she deals with, like the emotional labor, you know, that we put on women, um, whether her contribution to her marriage is valued because, you know, she's, she's a stay at home wife and yet she's a huge part of him. So there are a lot of different themes that I hope will spark conversation, but also, you know, this was the book that brought me back to my passion. Like, so the journey that they go on in the book where they are like, Rachel is very much like, it's okay to embrace my passion. It's And Nathan's like, it's okay to just love something and not be ashamed of it and be proud of it. That's a journey I went on, like coming back to writing. So I hope people read this book and they get inspired, like to return to like that hobby they put aside. There's a line in the book um, about how we stop being passionate about things like we out, like it's something we outgrow. And that is very much what I want people to think about when they read this book. Like you don't outgrow that, be proud of it, go back, find it, do it. It's part of who you are. And love that. I love that. So you mentioned before that you had a rom-com that you were kind of working on. I don't know if that's what something you're working on now, if we could even talk about anything that you're working on next. If you're even thinking about that, considering this is your first book and it's about to be published and maybe you're like, I need to take a five second breather. Don't ask me what I have coming up next. But if you have anything you'd love to share, I would love to hear it. And I'm sure everyone else would love to know more too. So my next book has already been um, kind of announced and um, it's out there. So it's coming out and it's supposed to come out in 2025, uh, fingers crossed. Um, It's called August Lane and it's about, um, it's kind of like a love letter to Black country musicians and Black Americana in that kind of world. And it's basically about this um, Black musician who... Uh, is a one hit wonder. He wrote like 20 years ago, he wrote um, a country song that was a huge hit. Um, and then his career just went, his trajectory of his career went in the toilet. In, um, in the toilet. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and so he gets one more chance at stardom. Um, but what no one knows is that he did not actually write his most fam- famous song. It was actually written by his high school, the woman, he, girl, woman he fell in love with in high school, mm-hmm. who is not happy. Her name is August Lane. And the book is about him kind of experiencing this reckoning and going in back and meeting her. And um, it's a second chance romance. I'll say less. Say I'm less. super excited about it. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so in 2025, you will be back here. God willing, a million times over. (laughs) And we'll do a deep dive of August Lane because now I need it. And whenever you have an advanced reader copy, 
you know where to find me. Yes, absolutely. Okay, good, absolutely. good. I'm happy we have an understanding here. But thank you so, so much for taking the time today. I'm so excited for everyone to read this book. I, I know it's just going to take out like uh, the bookstagram book talk. Like I know everyone's just going to be digitally obsessed with it. And I'm sure it's going to be everywhere in bookstores. And I'm just wishing you like nothing but the best. So much success. This is such a beautiful love story. And like, I can't wait for everyone else to fall in love with it too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>